and thanks for joining us today. Um, our webinar is the do's and don'ts of writing an instruction manual, and we're here with Rich Collins, who's an instructor and writer with Oregon State University, and I'm Paula Matano, I'm a program manager with Professional and Continuing Education. Uh, before we dive in, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items with you. Uh, we are recording this session, so feel free to ask questions during the webinar. You guys have a chat box, and it will send out to our entire panel, and we'll go ahead and address those as we go through. We'll also have a little bit of time at the end of the webinar presentation for you guys to ask any follow-up questions. And we also have um, the contact information for Rich and for myself that will go out along with this webinar recording once we're all done. So if you guys have anything else that comes up, please feel free to reach out. Okay, so Oregon State is an international public research university. It was founded in 1868. Oregon State is the state's land-grant university and is one of the only two universities in the United States to have sea, space, and sun grant designations as well. We have 336 million external research funding as of 2016, a second consecutive year of record-breaking growth, and Oregon State University actually accounts for more research funding than all of the state's comprehensive public universities combined. So professional and continuing education is proud to continue this tradition of excellence by engaging the community through educational opportunities for both personal enrichment and professional development. We offer hundreds of courses and certificate programs open to the public. These courses are designed to offer tangible value through quality programming that addresses educational, professional, and economic development goals for you or your organization. And partnerships provide amazing opportunities for professional and continuing education that advance careers, foster personal development, and benefit communities of all shapes and sizes. So PACE is committed to bringing the best of Oregon State University to people of all ages and industries, and we're proud to be partnering with Rich Collins to do just that. All right, so let's go over our agenda for today. The first thing I'm going to do is introduce our instructor, Rich Collins, and then he's going to present the do's and don'ts of writing an instruction manual. We're going to go over our PACE course offering of technical writing, which is a 100% online course. And we're going to talk a little bit about those program benefits. At the end of that, we'll have a question and answer session if you guys have any follow-up questions. But again, feel free to chat us any questions throughout the presentation as well. And we'll wrap up with a little bit about our PACE contacts and how you can follow up with us. So today I would like to introduce our instructor, Rich Collins. Rich holds an MA in English Literature from Oregon State University and a Bachelor's in English with minors in German, Creative Writing, and Film Studies from the University of West Georgia. Rich has worked in a variety of areas in his professional career, starting in retail, volunteering for a year in the nonprofit sector as an MTCC AmeriCorps VISTA work, working in the health insurance industry, and most recently working in college administration doing marketing and recruitment. Currently, he serves as an instructor where he focuses on bringing these experiences into the classroom to work with students in a variety of fields. His own research interests center on 20th century American literature, but he is equally committed to assisting and guiding developing writers in the classroom. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Rich, take it away with the do's and don'ts of writing an instruction manual. All right. Thank you, Paula. So hi, my name is Rich Collins, and I am an instructor, and I also have writer listed here. I do some marketing work for Oregon State University as well, so kind of a lot of different hats. And here we are going to get started with the five do's and don'ts of technical uh, writing or of writing an instruction manual. But the thing I want to stress uh, before we kind of jump in is that although today we'll be talking specifically about instruction manuals, a lot of these tips apply more generally to the genre of technical writing overall. And so you can kind of uh, use these as a general guide whenever you're working on a variety of documents. So we're going to start off with the five don'ts. So the first don't is don't use terms that your reader doesn't know. Um, I think that this happens a lot whenever we're used to using specialized language. We kind of uh, use jargon without really realizing that that's what we're doing. And it can be difficult to people who are outside of those discourse communities to access the information. Uh, so we have some examples here of uh, GUI, or graphical user interface. Uh, capacity building, which is a, a phrase that I encountered a lot when I was working in the nonprofit sector and, and really didn't know what it meant before um, I started working there. You just see it thrown around um, all the time. Rhizomatic infrastructure, and then K2TOG, which I found out by teaching technical writing is a knitting term, I believe. 
um, because I have some students who write instruction manuals on how to knit different things. And so the thing that I would stress whenever we're talking about using terms that your reader doesn't know, it's okay to use these terms sometimes, but you want to be sure that you define them in the beginning and that you're careful about how you use them um, whenever you're working on these documents. Do you have anything to add to that, Claire? Or? Um, no, I, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Claire. I'm also a writing instructor with Oregon State University and with Pace. Um, I definitely uh, have had the issue as a user of a, an instruction manual where somebody is um, using terms that are not familiar to me and then I have to take a break from whatever I'm doing and go to Google and see if I can track down the meaning of that term myself, which is frustrating as a user. And usually in technical writing, writing this kind of document, you want to avoid that kind of frustration. Um, that your user does not experience that. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, and I think that blends really well into our next point, which is don't forget to be consistent with your terms um, because it's, it's important to define your terms early on, but it's also important to use them consistently throughout your documents um, in order to avoid that confusion. Um, and so you can use those specific terms often, um, but just double check for words that you haven't defined or explained in your, in your instruction manuals so that you're not confusing your user. Um, I think it happens, I see it a lot in more um, for people who are writing instruction manuals who are new to it, but you even run into this sometimes with larger companies whenever you're trying to assemble a piece of furniture or whenever you're trying to complete a process and you kind of get confused. And I would say uh, one of the things we can kind of touch on throughout uh, this presentation is that any time there's a point of confusion from you as a user trying to complete a process, that's basically an instance where technical writing is failing you. And so I think that that's why it's important to define the terms early on and to use them consistently throughout. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I think that's one of those things where the longer you've been in industry, it can get difficult to remember what is not familiar to other people. I remember when I started work in the financial services industry a few years ago, well, a number of years ago now, um, there were a lot of terms that I had never encountered before, um, a lot of different technical um, terms for various types of retirement accounts and the various tax laws, and there were abbreviations and acronyms people were throwing around. and. Um, they were just sort of throwing them around as if I knew them, which I did not. Um, and I think that if they had remembered what it was like when they first started working there, they would have probably remembered which terms were not common knowledge um, and need to be defined um, before, before people can really move on with understanding what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's really important in instruction manuals, but I would, I would definitely stress that I think every new job I've had, acronyms especially, get me. And there's always a ton of them that get thrown around in the workplace without us really thinking about them. Um, and you kind of have to slowly learn those and accumulate that knowledge as you um, become an insider. Yeah, and it's important to be consistent with them, too, I mean, as the slide says, because sometimes uh, an organization will sort of shift what, they're, what term they're using to refer to a certain thing. Um, I know we've gone through that a couple of times in the writing department with um, our business writing class. Sometimes, in some places, we have called it workplace writing, and other places, places we've called it business writing. And that kind of inconsistency can be confusing to people who um, don't realize that we're talking about the same thing. So consistency right. is a, a really important thing for making sure that your your user understands what you're trying to get across. Definitely. So the next point is don't write long, complicated sentences. So I've got an example here. Uh, when assembling your bench, it is necessary to first drill pocket holes using your Craig jig in the appropriate depth setting. With your power drill, paying careful attention not to go too deep and accidentally drill through the surface and cause the screw to come out the other side. Um, so these can be really difficult for users to follow along with. Um, you might be able to tell I've actually been doing some spring construction projects and maybe uh, this is coming from some personal experience. But I would also say uh, this is something I encounter a lot in recipes, which um, oftentimes I'll have students kind of do recipes as an instruction manual because it's a genre they're familiar with, um, even if it has different outcomes and different things that they're, they're having to include. 
Um, but you'll notice that sometimes if you have a recipe that has like a paragraph of information and then you're trying to cook and do all of these different things and you're having to go back and find your place and it's just really difficult for you as a user to identify uh, where it is that you are on the page and to identify what you need to be doing in that moment. And so I think having it broken up into shorter sentences and uh, utilizing some formatting that all kind of the information kind of helps the user check things off as they go in the instruction manual. Yeah, it's one thing to find your place on the page after you've had to look away to do whatever task you're trying to complete, but it's another thing to have to find your place within one sentence. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's a lot harder on the user if they have to locate where in the sentence they stopped um, to go stop reading to go do the task. Yeah, definitely. I think splitting it up makes it much easier on the user. So also, whenever you're working on an instruction manual, don't forget to warn your user of dangers. Um, and, so, and these can kind of range in, in the level of severity. So we have some examples here. Remember to unplug the toaster oven before you begin cleaning. Caution, the next step requires working with electricity with a huge caution there. And then please consult Appendix B for more information on the model available in your country. And so the thing that I want to stress with this step, and especially these three examples, is that the reasoning behind why you might want to warn your user of something can vary. So it can be something as severe as potential hazards that could include death if you're working with electricity, um, to just keeping them comfortable and just giving them the knowledge that they need to complete the task at hand. So um, I kind of divide these up whenever I'm teaching instruction manuals into hazards and warnings and then kind of troubleshooting tips. But I think that uh, they're equally useful whenever you're working on technical writing documents. Um, and the other thing I would add is that you generally want to separate out, separate the formatting a little bit to draw more attention to these areas because if you just write them in the same formatting that the rest of the text is in, then they're really going to blend in and not stand out to the user. Yeah, uh, I agree. The, the formatting there is a huge part of the warning. It really doesn't do its job if it doesn't stand out from the rest of the steps. Um, and, and I think that like protecting, we were talking about frustration a few slides ago, I think protecting the reader from frustration is another thing that can come in the warnings. Like if I'm, if I'm working on a knitting pattern and there's a part that is really tricky, it's helpful for me to have some advanced warning of that, um, that I know that like I need to be extra careful at that particular stage or perhaps I shouldn't work on that particular part of the pattern when I'm really tired or um, there's some other, um, something else like that might interfere with my ability to, to do that piece. Having that warning lets me make an informed decision there, which uh, saves me frustration and potentially saves the project that I'm trying to complete. Yeah, definitely. And I would say that um, all of this also relates to some of the things we've been talking about where you're just keeping the user comfortable. So if you think back, um, just to stick with the knitting pattern, if you think back to as a beginner, there would be pieces of insider knowledge that you might not be familiar with um, when they're writing that kind of becomes uh, commonplace later on. And yeah. so the troubleshooting tips can be a way to take a step back and remember what it was like to be a beginner and to just um, make that document more accessible for users. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about um, just amongst ourselves is like some of the differences between business and technical writing and what those audiences look like. And I think ultimately technical writing is a little bit more of a specialized audience. You know, if someone is reading an instruction manual on how to interact with a piece of technology or how to build something, then they have some specialized knowledge, but they're not an expert in the field. And so having some language in there to kind of guide them through that process can be useful. Yep, definitely. And so the last don't that we have here is don't assume too much of your audience's knowledge. Um, so I have some examples here. Drill a pocket hole using your Craig jig, install the CPU, and cast on 100 stitches. Um, this kind of goes along with the same thing we're just talking about, where you're assuming too much about your audience and assuming that they know what a Craig jig even is. I had to look this up whenever I've been uh, building a garden bench recently. And so um, kind of guiding the user through that process. And it's like the second example there, install the CPU. That's actually an example I've seen in an instruction manual that's talking about putting a computer back together. And it's like, well, actually, that's a pretty complicated process in and of itself. Um, and there are some, you know, you, you need a little bit more guidance than just do it. And so taking a step back and really breaking down um, all of the different components of the process for the user to help guide them through that. Yeah, especially, I mean, sometimes you can, 
you can sort of have instruction manuals within instruction manuals. So, I mean, I'm more familiar with the knitting example than the building a computer example. But, um, you know, if I see cast on 100 stitches in a pattern, uh, if I don't know how to cast on, I might, the, the instruction manual could uh, link me to or direct me to another mini instruction manual, maybe as an appendix or as a separate manual together that instructs me how to do that process of casting on stitches. Maybe that's a separate skill and needs its own manual, but um, you certainly want to make sure that your reader has access to the information one way or another of how to, to do those complicated steps within um, the process that you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, as we kind of are changing the way that we consume instruction manuals, a lot of times we'll find them online. And yep. that can be a really great way of doing that because you can kind of hyperlink to an external source yep. or have a video in there or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so I think with print, it can be a little more difficult. Maybe it's something you're putting in an appendix, but yeah. there are certainly different ways that these uh, these points are changing. Yeah. So we've covered the don'ts. Now uh, we're going to talk about the five do's of writing an instruction manual. So how, what steps you can do to make sure that you are keeping your users safe um, and comfortable as they're going through the process. So the first thing is that you do want to tell your audience exactly what need. Um, so we have another recipe example here with a few um, ingredients that would be included. The key component I would stress here is that it's important to be thorough, not to forget items, and not to forget tools that you might take for granted. Um, so if you're accustomed to doing a process um, and you're writing an instruction manual about it, you might take it for granted that the user has a screwdriver, for example, and then they get to step five and it says to, um, to use a screwdriver to bolt something together and they didn't know they needed that from the beginning, they've never completed this process before, and now they have to stop and go find uh, the tool that they need. And so being sure that you take a step back from the process and detail exactly everything that they're going to need at the very beginning of the instruction manual can be really helpful. Yeah, that's really important, especially like, for some reason the example that occurs to me is um, undergraduate students kind of moving into their own place for the first time, and they, you know, need to put together their new furniture, but they might not have a fully stocked, um, you know, uh, toolkit. They might know how to use tools, but they might have been using their parents' tools before, and now suddenly they don't have what they need. Uh, and if you don't tell them until step five, then they might, you might end up leaving your user with, like, pieces of furniture strewn across the floor and they have to go find a screwdriver before they can make any progress. Right. Yeah, and I think that this is somewhere where um, I always think of IKEA instruction yeah. manuals <laughs> are like really powerful examples that don't use any language but are still technical writing. Um, and they often include tools, but oftentimes you want to be using your own tools in those situations anyways. So the next uh, piece that we're going to talk about is do use diagrams to show movement. And we have a couple of examples there on the screen. I think this is another area where when we're consuming instruction manuals digitally, whether online um, or in other formats, that you can kind of change this. So I see instruction manuals online will make really good use of GIFs or GIFs, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, or videos in order to show movement. But even in print documents, you can there are ways to show uh, to show those things. And I would say the other element here that's not really illustrated is to, you can use diagrams to kind of guide the user's view. So I found instruction manuals where you're putting a computer back together and they'll have boxes around uh, where the key components that you're dealing with are uh, located and then kind of descriptions of what they are and things like that. And so there are a lot of different ways you can use diagrams in an instruction manual to help guide the user yeah. through the process. And I think it's really helpful also to label those diagrams and refer to them in the text of your user manual. So if you're, um, if there's a particularly complicated piece of the process that you are describing and you have a, a diagram to kind of help illustrate that, um, referring to that diagram directly in the steps that you've outlined is going to be really helpful for your reader so they know exactly when to look at the pictures and, and which steps the pictures are actually referring to. Definitely. That's actually a great transition into our next point, which is do label and name your steps and caption your images. Um, I think that this is something I see a lot in uh, beginning instruction manuals where the person who's writing it sees the relation between the text and the image and they get that connection. 
but the end user may not understand that connection, especially if you have a lot of images or you know if there's a lot going on. And so I think being very clear about what those connections are can be really helpful. And this is an area where I would always rather overdo it than to yeah. underdo it. Like I would rather that the user have more information and guidance and connections than they need than for them to be stuck in a position where they don't understand what's happening or they uh, get confused about the process. And so I think that this helps to keep that relation between the text and the image more clear um, and just helps to guide the user. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think that we, you know, we have this sort of common saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think a lot of us, our instinct is to kind of see that, or to, to think that our, our images are sort of self-explanatory, but they're, they're not always as self-explanatory as we think. Um, I know that I, I was working on a report last week uh, that included a couple of graphs. Uh, and to me, at first, I was thinking, oh, well, these graphs, are, like what they mean uh, is very clear and, and you know my reader would totally understand that without any additional uh, explanation but the more that I thought about it the more I realized it was clear to me because I had constructed the graph and I knew what it was referring to and what uh, meaning I want I wanted the reader to draw from it but that would not necessarily be clear without me explaining it and referring to that graph specifically uh, within my uh, within the, the text of my report. Yeah, definitely. So our next to last point here on the things that you should do, um, do use imperative mood writing throughout. And so we've got some examples of imperative mood here. Be careful when assembling, do not inhale fumes, test before using, and please use only with our brand of products. So imperative mood is dealing with commands um, and kind of ordering the, the user um, as to what they should do. And one of the things that I think is really compelling about technical writing versus other forms is that you're, you're trying to keep your users safe and comfortable and guide them through the process, but you're not really having to care for their emotions in the same way that you do in business writing, for example. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing an email to someone, you're having to take you know, these power dynamics into, play, into, into your thought process and trying to make sure that you're taking their feelings into account and all of these different things. But for an instruction manual, the user just coming to information. And so they just want to complete a process. So if they come to you for information on how to assemble a cabinet and you say, well, you bolt this piece to that piece, that's fine. Um, that's not being offensive or short. Um, it's being um, concise and helping them through the process. And so I think that that's one of the things I find really interesting about technical writing because you can really cut through um, a lot of the kind of fluff or a lot of the extra speech that we might include in other forms. Yeah, in an email you might say, I would like you to do this by the end of the day, whereas in an instruction manual you would just say, do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd be like, well, if, you know, you need to glue these two pieces together and let them sit for 12 hours or they're going to fall apart. Right, so, yeah, yeah. It's much more, I think, straightforward. Yeah, that. and it's a diff in the genre of instruction manuals, that, that imperative mood does not come across as rude or impolite the way that it probably would in almost every other kind of writing that I can think of. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's more concise and it um, it does, be, I think because it's more concise, there's fewer words because um, basically in the imperative mood, you take out the, the subject, the mm -hmm. you, you is the subject, but it's implied. Um, you don't have to say it specifically. And anytime you can remove words like that from the sentence um, that aren't really needed, it's going to help your reader focus on the part of the sentence that is needed, which in this case is, you know, the, the instruction that you're instructing them to do, um, whether they're supposed to not inhale fumes or be careful when assembling, etc. Right, definitely. And I think that blends well into our last point here, which is that you do want to use a user-centered approach in your writing. And so, although you're using imperative mood and, and kind of ordering the user around, you want to keep their best interest in mind. So remember their perspective, you know, take a step back, think about their situation, think about their level of knowledge and write to that. And you know, this user-centered approach I think is really the key takeaway from technical writing and is something that we focus on extensively in the course where we kind of look at the way that this user-centered approach changes for instruction manuals or for technical descriptions or for memos or for a variety of documents. Um, but it's something that I think really ties the course together. Um, for any of you who might have been in our webinar yesterday on business writing, 
um, we call it you attitude in business writing. So it's kind of a similar thing that you're talking about with just keeping the user in mind, keeping uh, your audience in mind, and keeping their needs in mind. Yeah, uh, I think that one of those things about getting in, like, just to kind of get in the head of your user and and really know who the user is if your particular user manual um, or instruction manual. And so, I mean, it's not always going to be the same. One thing you can do is to kind of be specific about that uh, up front. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of knitting patterns. To go back to that example, say uh, right off the bat that this pattern is for an expert level knitter or this is for a beginner knitter. Um, and that helps to narrow down the user so you can make certain assumptions on who that user is based on the level of expertise that you have specified um, at the beginning. But um, you don't always have that luxury. Sometimes you don't know who is going to be the user of your document. And so then you want to make sure that you have accounted for any particular level of skill or expertise that um, that might be um, possessed by any particular uh, user that could pick up your user manual and use it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so those are our points. We have time for questions now, and we've got a couple that I'm going to kind of take a look at, but feel free to send any more in that you might have that you've been thinking about. So one question is, uh, can you keep an informal tone and still create a professional manual? Definitely. I think that this actually ties in really well to keeping a user-centered approach. So um, I'm currently teaching technical writing um, here at OSU, and one of my favorite instruction manuals from this quarter was on how to do a good set of barbecue ribs. And so if you've got a user who's coming to you for how to do barbecue ribs, you don't need to be incredibly formal. And so it had a pretty laid back tone and it was, you know, even had a few jokes in there. I think it kept talking about, you know, maybe it was time to go and get a cold one and some things like that. <laughs> um, and that's completely fine for an instruction manual on how to do barbecue ribs because that's keeping your user in mind um, and, and meeting them where they are. Mm -hmm. If you're doing an instruction manual on, you know, how to ground an electrical line in a factory, you're probably going to be a little bit more serious. The, the stakes are a little bit higher there. So I think that it all comes down to keeping that end user in mind and thinking yeah. about where they are. I think the professionalism really comes down to whether uh, the user or the instruction manual is successful, whether um, the user can complete the instructions that you have given them. And how formal or informal you are in delivering those instructions really depends on the situation. But it's, a, it's going to be a professional level, professional quality instruction manual if the user can complete the process that you're trying to instruct them in. Right, definitely. And the other part of the professional tone is that in all of these, you want to make sure that your writing is top notch. So even if you're you know, having kind of a joking tone or, or being laid back, um, you're still not going to have any grammatical errors and it's still right. going to be very clearly written. And so it's, it's still keeping that professionalism. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just kind of changing the, the way that you're delivering that. Yeah, adjusting the tone or the mood for the particular circumstances. Definitely. So circumstances are not always the same. Right. Barbecuing ribs is not the same as doing major electrical work. Definitely. So another question we have here is, what have you found to be the most common frustration around creating instruction manuals, and do we have a tip to solve that? I think for me, um, the most common frustration is one that we've touched on quite a bit, but is just trying to take a step back and think about where that beginning user is coming from. I think that especially for things that we're interested in, so I encourage my students to write instruction manuals that connect with their major or their uh, career or their or hobby in some way. And the problem with that is that we're often very intimately familiar with all the details that are involved in that. And so whenever we just kind of want to jump in and get to the parts that we're excited about um, in the process. But for someone who's new to the process, you have to do a little bit more legwork than that. And so the thing that I find most useful, and this is just something that's useful with writing in general, is just giving yourself time to kind of put a draft out there um, and then walk through it slowly and really think critically about each step. Another thing that can be useful whenever you're writing instruction manuals is to have someone who has no idea about the process to read, read through it and see um, if it seems effective to them, if they have any questions or confusion or, or elements like that. Because 
You know, if someone has never completed the process and you give them an instruction manual and they're able to do it, that's probably a pretty good sign that it's successful, even if you may need to uh, still evaluate it on your own and see what you might need to add. Yeah, I think those are both really good tips for addressing that frustration. I was going to say the same thing about drafting. Uh, I think it's a really good process or good practice for many people uh, in their writing process to just get a first draft out there, um, focusing on getting down all of the knowledge that they have, that they think they want to convey, and then uh, in a second draft, in a revision, to go back through and see, all right, well, where am I relying on my insider knowledge and where do I need to explain things more for somebody who does not come at this process with that insider knowledge. Right. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of a lot for most of us anyway to do that thinking while you're developing your process the first time around. So to me, like dividing those into separate steps of the writing process is uh, the most effective way to approach that. Yeah, and I would say also so for people who are doing any kind of technical writing in their career, it can be difficult to go through that process whenever you know you're having to do something for your job and the stakes are pretty high and you know you're depending on it for your advancement which is a place where a course like this comes in really handy um, because you'll get feedback from me uh, I do one-on-one -on -one feedback on all of the documents for our technical writing courses and you can kind of go through that writing process in a constructed format but in a way that um, can be I think really useful for the long term whenever you're working on these documents um, in real life. I think that um, the value of courses like this is that it gives you some good practices um, that once you kind of incorporate those practices into your regular working life, they become a little bit more automatic and a little bit more efficient and eventually like even though you know we're telling you to take time to, to write, um, write as a process and, and do things in multiple steps and you might not feel like you have time for that, um, the more times you engage in that process, the more quickly you're going to be able to move through it because you've sort of developed this habit of mind, habit of writing that um, that you can you can go through pretty efficiently, and pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. So I think we can let Paula talk a little bit about the course. All right. Thank you so much, Rich and Claire. On behalf of our team at Pace, we really want to thank you for your time today sharing your knowledge and expertise on the do's and don'ts of writing an instruction manual, and also going over our technical writing online course a little bit. Um, we're really excited to be partnering with you and offering this content. I know a lot of students in past offerings of this course have gotten a lot out of it and have really been able to apply it directly to the work that they're doing, which is great and our goal here at Pace. So a little bit about this course. It starts on July 3rd, and you can follow the registration link on this presentation or visit our webpage at Pace oregonstate.edu. The course is 100% online and is instructor-led, so you'll be able to go through the material at your own pace during the week. Uh, you'll have assignments and discussion boards that you can interact with, and like Rich said, he'll be there to give you feedback and help guide you if you have any questions or concerns as you move along. The course is $199, but if you're a webinar attendee today, you do get a 10% off code when you register online. And you'll get that within the next 24 hours once we send out the uh, webinar recording. And you also get 1.6 continuing education units. So if you need those for your uh, professional development or your work or anything like that, this does count for that. And we can give you those once you complete the course. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about, and Rich can jump in here as well, is who should be in this program. Um, so a lot of the times what we see is uh, career switchers, freelancers, marketing and communication employees. Um, as well as anybody who wants to write explanations of data or detailed information. So, Rich, is there anybody else that you kind of think should focus in on this? Or? Yeah, I think anyone um, who is writing processes or wants to write processes. So, actually, this is a good point. We had another question come through that says, have you ever had a student work on a big stakes project or proposal throughout the course that they were able to then fine tune it with my personal guidance? Um, and I've actually had, so I had a student in my course who worked for her family business and was working in shipping and receiving and was bringing in these new employees that needed to train them on uh, the processes that they went through. And so she was able to actually produce a document and instruct kind of guided them through um, what the receiving process looks like and then get some feedback from me on, on how that might be clear and more made more clear and useful um, for new employees. And so I think the benefit of a course like this that is kind of an overview of technical writing 
is that it isn't super specific to the point where you would have to be specifically a technical writer to benefit from it. I think anyone who is doing this kind of writing in their uh, job or who wants to do this kind of writing can benefit. And I think you know, some of the things that we talk about will be relevant to instruction manuals and technical descriptions, but also just writing in general um, in the workplace as far as you know, writing in a way that is clear and concise and to the point. Um, I think those are kind of those are things that most people can benefit from. Awesome. Yeah, and I know uh, here at Pace we take advantage of having Claire and Rich in our backyard and ask them for help and advice as much as we can. So I encourage you guys to engage with them. Um, so you guys are going to learn a lot. Rich and Claire did a good job of going over what this course is going to look like, especially in their how-to of the technical manual. Uh, um, so you're going to be talking about professional technical writing, uh, design and style and layout, and sort of what kind of tone you guys want to um, engage with. Um, so we are, we are pretty excited. And if you have any questions about a little bit more about this uh, course, please do let us know. It's also four weeks long, which is really great because you guys can get in and get get the information that you need quickly and in, in a direct way. So why choose PACE's programs? You'll see an immediate return on your investment because our courses are designed to meet the demands of today's changing job market. Um, and this course can really diversify your skills and build your resume. And as Rich said, you guys can bring in any documents that you may be working on currently with your job um, and help and work with him and get some of his expertise as you go through that. Um, and our courses are also great for personal enrichment, and we do have a state-of-the-art learning management system. It's an online course, so we try to mimic um, the experience of being in classroom as much as we can um, through interactions and learning engagements as well. Okay, so to get started, you guys can um, go to our website, and our course starts on July 3rd. Uh, webinar attendees will receive a 10% off discount coupon, and if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. You can email us at PACE, or you can email Rich directly or myself. I'm Paula Natano, the Program Manager. Um, and we're going to wrap up today, but thank you all for joining us, and we really hope you'll join us for our technical writing course. Go Beats!